a massive coal plant cleans up its act and lights up millions of homes with explosive power. This mega roller coaster cranks up the biggest scare for your buck. A thrill machine that runs on gravity. A half megaton telescope takes intergalactic snapshots from millions of light years away. And a pin setting robot cleans up our game with surgical precision. Let's take a look inside these machines and see how they work. This is Drax, a coal-fired power plant in England. The size of two Manhattan Central Parks side by side. This machine puts out almost 4,000 megawatts of power, enough to light up 5 million homes. This new style coal burner has found a way to process and burn an old style fuel and it does it so efficiently, it's now among the cleanest mega coal plants in the world. Let's see how it works. Drax burns up to 36,000 tons of coal every day. That's 26 train loads. The trains dump the coal into giant hoppers. They slow down, but never stop. Every month, they dump enough coal to fill a 70,000-seat football stadium. But Drax doesn't burn chunks of rock. It's not explosive enough. So it converts the coal to dust. A network of conveyors sends the raw coal to these pulverizing mills. Each mill has 10 one-ton steel balls packed together on a track. Coal drops into the mill through here, and the ring of balls crush the rock. A single pulverizer makes 36 tons of coal dust in an hour, and Drax has 60 of them. The coal dust is now an explosive fuel, lit up by propane and oil burners. This coal dust and air mixture burns at over 2,000 degrees Celsius. Each boiler is a mega kettle with flames five stories high. 10 stories above the flames, inside a network of steel tubes, Water transforms to high-pressure steam, hot enough to melt lead. Drax is now ready to generate some serious electricity. The steam heads to the turbine hall. The turbines are housed in six units, each the size of a locomotive. Inside, five steam turbines. Each spins a drive shaft connected to a generator. When the steam hits the turbines, its explosive pressure spins the blades at 3,000 RPM. The blade tips travel at one and a half times the speed of sound, pumping out a million horsepower. That's the same as 6,500 passenger cars. So, burn coal, boil water, make steam, and spin 300 tons of stainless steel at Mach 1.6 to create 23,000 volts of electricity. Voltage measures how powerfully electrons flow through a wire. And Drax needs much more than 23,000 volts to get power to its millions of customers. 
To ramp up its voltage, which helps electricity travel great distances, you need a transformer. Drax runs the 23,000 volts through a series of copper wire coils, each wound around an iron core. That creates a magnetic field. Power jumps from one coil to another. When it goes from the looser coils to the tighter ones, the voltage increases. The transformers at Drax take the 23,000 volts from the turbines and step it up to 400,000. Which is great for the national grid. But what about this stuff? Burning coal is dirty business. It belches out harmful gases that cause smog and acid rain. Drax captures 90% of these toxic emissions before they hit the atmosphere. Smoke blows into these electrostatic precipitators. Toxic particles cling to these metal plates like fridge magnets as the smoke passes through. But that filtered smoke still contains sulfur, the culprit in acid rain. So before it's sent to the smokestack, it's cleaned again. Every week, 10,000 tons of limestone is crushed into powder and mixed with water to form a slurry in this giant blender. When smoke is pumped through the slurry, sulfur is chemically locked into it. The resulting combo makes 750,000 tons of gypsum every year. The stuff that makes drywall and plasterboard. There's one last problem. The power plant still has huge amounts of steam to deal with. Once it's done powering the turbines, the steam needs to get back to the boilers for reheating. But first, it needs to turn back to water. So the steam tubes are cooled by an outside source, a heat exchanger that uses river water. Drax uses 160 million liters of it every day from the river Ouse. But while cooling the steam tubes, the river water heats up to the boiling point. To protect the local ecosystem, it has to be cooled before being returned. Enter the cooling towers. Drax has 12, two for each boiler. The base of each one could hold the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. The heated river water is piped into the 20-story towers, then drops through tightly woven plastic and turns to a fine spray. As heat rises, the towers draw a cool draft from the bottom and up through the falling droplets. The cooled water drops into ponds at the base of the towers and releases back to the river, cleaner than when they took it out. 36,000 tons of coal burnt up in a day, recovering most of its toxic emissions. This machine has always been powerful, but recent innovations have turned it into one of the cleanest plants of its size in the world. An over one kilometer track built on 20 stories of concrete and metal. The Ride of Steel is a machine designed to give you the biggest scare of your life. Doing 120 in an open top mini train is scary enough, but not nearly as frightening as this. For two whole minutes, you're locked into a bucket on wheels. The job of this machine is to keep you alive with no engine, no steering, and no brakes. Here's how it works. 
You're on your way, and the initial climb slopes gradually to a height of 65 meters. 12,000 well-oiled moving parts make up the large gear and chain assembly that pull you to the top. While butterflies churn in your stomach, any one of those parts can snap without warning. But over 40 sensors monitor the climb. And if the chain breaks, magnetically controlled safety locks stop the train within seconds. The first hill on a roller coaster is always the tallest. It has to be in order to harness enough gravity to launch you 1,600 meters to the finish. Fifty seconds into the ride, the train free falls into a near vertical drop. Zero to 120 in under two seconds. Way faster than most dragsters. As you drop, you're weightless. Any falling body weighs nothing while in free fall, until it hits something. Fortunately, you're locked in by the lap bar. Without that, you'd be airborne, flying three stories above the track. The force exerted on the cars as they corner around the track is more powerful than what's experienced on a space shuttle launch. So, to keep the train on the track, the undercarriage has three sets of wheels built in all directions to handle every dimension of flight. These are the load wheels. During the most intense maneuvers, they absorb nearly four times the weight of the car. That's over 50 tons of force. The guide wheels keep the car centered as it shifts from side to side. And the upstop wheels grip the car on the track during its most extreme maneuvers. 65 seconds into the ride, you're halfway through. Just when you think you're slowing down, you hit the ride of steel's double helix at 100 kilometers an hour. And while your brain thinks it's going in a straight line, your body is lashed to a train that is clinging to the edge of a circle. Up to four times the normal force of gravity pins your body down. That cell phone in your pocket now weighs as much as a kilogram. You've been flying for almost 120 seconds, and the end is rapidly approaching. Remember, this is technically a runaway train. It has no brakes. And you've got to stop in under three seconds, you're going off the rails. Regular brakes on this train would tear the cars apart. So the designers decided to stop the train from the outside. And they used some of the most powerful natural magnets in the world to do it. When copper fins fixed to the sides of the train slide through the magnets, they create a swirl of opposing currents. This magnetic braking stops the train in just 2.8 seconds. The designers of the Ride of Steel had a plan. Build a giant machine, insert humans, scare them half to death, and bring them back alive. And it worked. When scientists peer through a high-powered telescope, they may like the view, but they always want a better one. So, they came up with this. It's called the Large Binocular Telescope, or LBT. It probes deeper into the cosmos than any other instrument, and it has 10 times the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. A telescope is basically a magnifying glass. It focuses light that enters here onto a single point. In this case, a mirror located here. This bounces the light to an eyepiece that magnifies it even more, up to 60 times. That's pretty good, but its vision is still limited. Big glass lenses are hard to make and distort light, which is why the best telescopes use mirrors. 
set 3,000 meters up this Arizona peak. The machine took two decades to build. It's a new generation telescope that reaches the edge of the universe, hoping to shed light on some of its unsolved mysteries. That's a tall order, but it's a big machine. The LBT is two telescopes in one. With its giant pair of binoculars and two of the world's largest mirrors, 16 tons apiece, spanning eight and a half meters. Working together, they capture more light than any telescope ever built. Starlight bounces off the two primary mirrors onto two smaller secondary mirrors, and then back down through this center hole to where researchers can see it or record it. But all this size doesn't do much for resolution. So LBT has to overcome the three optical challenges of any Earth-bound telescope. Keeping up with the rotation of the Earth, fighting gravity that distorts the shape of thin mirrors this wide, and keeping focus through the density of the Earth's atmosphere. First challenge, get a fix on a target and compensate for the Earth's rotation. This half megaton machine has to position itself within a millionth of a centimeter. That's about the thickness of a strand of DNA. May sound crazy, but it's done with this altitude azimuth mount. One axis turns with the Earth, the other tweaks the elevation. A point and control system translates the location of the object in the sky into geographical coordinates and locks into them as the Earth moves. The entire telescope incrementally shifts on two giant C-shaped mounts, like a big rocking chair floating on a super slick film of oil. It's so perfectly balanced that all it takes is a set of four puny lawnmower size motors, one on each axis, to spin the heavy LBT a full 360 in just four minutes. The outer building rotates in sync with the telescope as it rides on its own rail system. And it does it to within 1.5 degrees of accuracy, even in gale force winds. The second optical challenge it needs to solve is gravitational distortion of the primary mirrors. The mirrors are so large, so thin, gravity actually warps their perfect parabolic shape. To correct this, there are 160 computer-controlled actuators underneath each primary mirror. These are like pistons that push up on the mirror to correct its parabolic shape and restore the image. The third optical challenge for the LBT is correcting distortions caused by the atmosphere. Stars don't really twinkle. It's the effect we see through atmospheric turbulence or haze. To lock that star's image into a single steady point of light, LBT locks onto a reference point, like a bright star that's already known. Computers measure the real-time angular distortions in the star's image to determine how much and what optical adjustments are needed to correct those distortions. 672 magnetic coils line the back of the hair-thin secondary mirrors. Each coil moves the surface up and down 1,000 times a second. The adaptive mirror surface actually distorts in real time to mathematically compensate for the angular distortions on the reference image. With the three major optical challenges figured out, the LBT has one more trick to help it see better than ever before. It ramps up its image brightness by swinging this pair of third mirrors into place, combining its binocular images into one super bright picture. That results in images like this nebula, over 113 million billion 
kilometers away. The LBT is the most powerful single mount telescope in the world. A heavy, rock solid machine tamed by precision feather touch controls. Its sole purpose is to capture and translate light into pictures of places we can only dream of visiting. Five million people all over the world throw a ball like this one and knock down billions of pins year after year after year. Not that long ago, teenagers used to reset these pins by hand, but that left restless bowlers waiting for the next shot. This robot is about to turn 50, and it never stops working. No lunch break here. It's cheap to run, doesn't suck up a lot of power, and it's fast. The Brunswick A2 pin setter can sweep up and rack a set of pins in just 9.2 seconds without fancy software. Just 4,000 moving parts that run like a clock. Let's see how it works. A typical throw will launch the three to seven kilogram ball into pins made from hard rock maple at over 30 kilometers per hour. The pin setter waits for its cue. When the ball passes this electronic eye, two things happen. A relay switch tells the A2 to get busy, while a camera snaps a picture and sends the data to the scoreboard. The A2 locates the standing pins and snatches them up, while a sweeper clears the pin deck of fallen ones. The same pins are then set back down in the exact position the bowler left them in. Back in the pit area, the fallen pins separate from the ball. A belt sends the pins to the top of the machine, where they drop into a metal tray called a turnaround pan. The weight of the pin's body makes it drop heavy part first into the pan, so they always load right side up into the distributor wheel. Each time a pin loads, it triggers a clutch, which moves the carousel into the next position, ready to take the next pin. While all that's going on, the A2 gets the ball back to the bowler ASAP. The ball makes its way through here, to an elevator. And from there, it rolls along a downslope tunnel as gravity sends it back to the player. At the end of the shaft, a series of motorized rollers send the ball up this S-shaped curve. It all happens at about the same time that it takes to tie your shoes. After the bowler takes his second and final shot of the frame, the sweeper clears any remaining pins. Sensors on the pin deck detect that there's no more standing wood. So, it sends a message to the distributor wheel to release the pins, all 10 of which are reset. The A2 automated pin setter machine completes its cycle like it has every day, every year, and every decade. Smoothly and efficiently, this old boy rarely keeps a bowler waiting.